Hey guys, recently I had a bit of a situation in my airplane, what I like to call a throttle cable departure in flight, aka the throttle cable had snapped and the engine was stuck running at full power. Uh, not really a big deal in my opinion, I wouldn't consider it an emergency, probably more of an abnormal operation. Uh, however, there were definitely some nuances and things that had to be considered. Uh, as you can appreciate, anytime you have to pull the mixture out on your single engine airplane, it's a little disconcerting, um, especially in flight. Um, however, the uh, outcome was successful, no damage to me, no damage to the airplane, uh, so it's all you can really hope for at the end. Now, to give you a bit of insight on the airplane I fly, uh, I fly a Stoltica 300, it's a long wing version, and I co-own this with three other guys. Uh, we essentially bought it a year ago, and it went through a very thorough maintenance regime. Basically, we had the engine rebuilt, we had a new propeller ordered, um, new aileron hinges made up by Greg Panzel, replaced a lot of the old hardware, and uh, got the airplane up to a, to a high standard, uh, especially considering how hard we're gonna be flying it. Uh, for myself, I routinely fly the airplane between plus eight, plus nine, negative five to negative seven, depending on the sequence. The airplane uh, itself has around 570 hours total time, and the engine was originally built by Dick DeMars. Uh, in fact, the airplane and the engine was actually built for Gene Hackman, the actor. So it's got a bit of a history to it. Um, it's the only one in Canada and uh, Quite honestly, it's an amazing airplane to fly. Not the highest performing monoplane out there, um, but still very capable. So let me explain why I'm sharing this video with you. Uh, first off, I record all of my aerobatic flights, and I do that for two reasons. First one is for self-critique, and second, to help identify weaknesses and strengths in my flying. I'm a huge believer in continuously progressing, and in order to progress, you gotta be open and transparent with yourself around where your weaknesses are, where your strengths are, and just continuously build on the previous flight. It's worked for me so far and I've had good success with it. And um, fortunately enough, I happened to capture the entire abnormal situation unfold. Uh, it's about nine minutes long and I'm gonna walk you through kind of play by play. Now, the reason why I'm sharing this video is I'm a huge believer in that uh, as pilots, when we have experiences, whether good or bad, we should be sharing those experiences in an effort to promote safety. While I wouldn't say I had a perfect handling of the situation, there were definitely things I would have done differently. I guess hindsight is twenty twenty in this situation, um, but I'm sharing because I believe it could help someone else if you ever run into this issue. Uh, I think we should be sharing more of our experiences, and uh, I, I believe that if we can all keep an open mind, we can all learn and get better. All right, guys, let me orient you to the environment and the conditions. What you're seeing here is a map of the local area. The uh, red rectangle with 05 and 23 on it is the runway. It's a 2,000 foot by 60 foot wide grass strip. Um, right off the bat, when you're flying a high performance uh, aerobatic airplane, um, you don't have a ton of room to work with here. Uh, not to say it's unsafe, it's perfectly safe. And I've operated the airplane in variety of conditions, anywhere from zero degrees Celsius, uh, was that 30 degrees Fahrenheit, um, all the way to, you know, 30, 35 degrees, hot, humid day, never been an issue. However, with that said, uh, there are things to consider, such as the power lines at the end of 2-3, which is about 50 feet high, and then you've got a house directly in the approach path, and then there's trees between 2-3 and the power lines just to the north there. So if you have a nice north northwesterly wind, uh, it can get really choppy over those trees. Um, so there's a lot of mechanical turbulence to contend with. Um, on this day, I was actually very fortunate. I had light winds blowing 3-5 to five knots, favoring 2-3, and the biggest um, factor in my decision-making was which runway do I land on. Do I take the headwind or do I take the tailwind? And I opted to take the tailwind for one uh, particular reason. And that was if I pull the mixture out and I'm gliding the airplane in, the last thing I want to do is be put in a situation where I'm low and slow, hit the power lines, or even worse, crash into someone's house, which would be, uh, in my opinion, just poor, um, poor aviation decision-making skills if I did take that option, considering I didn't have to. Now, if you look at the X's, those represent houses. Okay, so um, that was really important as well in terms of my decision making because I wanted to make sure I didn't uh, overfly anyone's house when I put the mixture out. Now, in the back of my mind, and the, when logic kicks in, uh, you know, there's a strong chance that the engine's going to come back online by putting the mixture back in, especially if the propeller's windmilling and the mags are on. Now, uh, with that said, the emotional side kicks in, and you start to ask yourself the question, what if it doesn't? Um, so I wanted to make sure I operated the airplane in, 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 in such a way that mitigate risk almost 100% for everyone else around me. So I created this kind of safe zone, which is the green box. 
So the green rectangle uh, basically provides a few options. One is 200 plus acres of flat land, albeit it was very muddy and soft, so it wouldn't be ideal, but it was better than landing on a road with power lines or crashing someone's house or landing on a terrain that's not flat. Uh, the second option was um, there's no obstacles in this area. Basically, there's nothing to contend with. I can fly my approach to 05 low. If I'm short, I can pull the prop out and uh, feather the propeller 100% and kind of give myself a boost to make it over the fence. Or if I was way too short and the, the engine didn't come back online, it wasn't, uh, wasn't the worst possible terrain you could have. Um, so it was also giving me some options. And then third, I guess, option was it really sets a parameter for my circuit. So if I initiate a go around in 05, my plan was to initiate an early left-hand turn and keep the circuit within this area. And by doing so, uh, it, it, again, just mitigated the risk for uh, people and property uh, around me. Now, uh, with that said, I mean, I did have to go around twice because I just didn't like the approach. And I'll talk more about why that was um, shortly. But uh, in my mind, I already made the decision if I put the mixture in, and the airplane or the engine doesn't come back online, um, I'm just gonna land straight ahead. Like I'll take what I can get at that point. So I gave myself two options and I was very definitive on that. I had made the binary decision to say, if the engine doesn't come back online, I'm going straight ahead. If it does, I'm gonna in initiate an early left hand turn to make sure I stay away from the houses and the power lines, um, just in case the engine did run into issues uh, during the uh, initiated go around. Now, uh, with that said, uh, let's get into the video and I'll walk you through play-by-play. -play. Here I'm finishing a slow roll and then immediately le initiate a left-hand turn and start to power back. First thing I notice, what well, I guess I don't notice, is the engine's not making a change in sound. Uh, I immediately cross reference that with uh, the manifold pressure gauge and notice that there's no change. As you can see, the throttle is completely loose and at this point, I decided to initiate a gentle climb and then try to troubleshoot. First thing I do is check the um, sheathing that runs from a base plate that, that goes behind the panel. Uh, the throttle rod runs into that sheathing and if that sheathing gets loose, uh, it can create a lot of slack in the line. So that's what I thought it was initially because I've seen that happen before. Uh, it turns out that that was not the case and the sheathing was fine. And in fact, the brake happened further down the line. All right, guys, just want to freeze frame for a minute here and orient you to the airport. Clearly, you can see the runways uh, 23 and 05. Uh, just to the south of 23, you can see the windsock. Now, uh, from the video, it's quite hard to see. Uh, in fact, from the cockpit, it's also quite tricky to see, hence why I needed to descend to get a good look at it before making a decision on which runway I'm going to land on. Uh, the solid red line represents power lines, which are about 50 feet high and a few hundred feet off the threshold of 23. And just prior to the power lines, there's a house directly on the approach path. All right, now with that context, let's get back to the video. Now, if you look off the wingtip, there's the airport. Okay, so at this point, I'm still climbing and you'll see me play around with the throttle, more or less trying to validate what I'm seeing or not seeing, which is the engine being completely unresponsive. So I think at this point, you're just trying to take any option you can get because maybe there's an off chance. And I think deep down, I knew there was no chance the engine was going to change power position unless I pulled the mixture. So now I'm just thinking about my options. I've given myself about three to five minutes to make a decision about what I'm going to do. I check for um, traffic. I look for uh, conditions. I look at uh, my fuel situation, which at this point I had around 20 minutes of gas remaining. I considered diverting to, to a longer airport or a longer runway, I should say. And uh, I didn't want to put myself in that situation where I'd be even lower on gas. I'd rather shoot some approaches and mitigate the, the risk there as much as possible. Now, I actually start to descend here because I want to check the windstock. I can't get a good look. Now, when I departed the airport, I left on runway 23. At, the point, at that point, the wind was negligible. And I was expecting the wind to be light anyway because that's what the forecast was calling. So I can't get a good look at the windstock. So I decided to descend. If you look around, um, it's kind of hard to see now, but there's houses peppered all around. So if you remember that chart I showed you, it gives you a good sense of the uh, area. Now where the wing is there, so there's power lines on that road and there's the uh, threshold of 2-3. Uh, I can't see the windsock, so I get even lower. 
because I really want to make sure that, you know, my preference was 0.5. I want to make sure the wind hadn't picked up, which, you know, subconsciously I knew it, um, but I just wanted to validate it. Again, in an effort to mitigate as much risk as possible. At this point, I quickly determined that the wind is blowing about three to five knots down two, three. So for me, that was good news. That means I could take a tailwind on zero five. All right, once I got the wind, I decided to climb up. And at this point, I'm going through the next phase of my decision making, and that's when am I gonna pull the mixture? So I didn't wanna just waste time by burning fuel and then being in a position where I've got even less fuel. So um, I basically climb up, I'm turning toward the south now, and my plan is to overfly the, uh, the airport and pull the mixture out. Now, before I actually initiate my approach, I wanna test the mixture, make sure it's functioning. So um, I plan on pulling the mixture out two times just to make sure the engine would come back online. Now, I know it's not great for the engine, especially considering the cooler conditions. Um, however, at that point, I didn't, I didn't really care about the engine. I was just thinking about how to get the plane down safely. Okay, you see my hand on the mixture there? There's the first cycle. It's the second. And then I actually pull it all the way out at this point. Now note the prop. I left the prop in its original position, which was set for 2,500 RPM. Uh, the one thing I wasn't really cluing onto, and funny enough, I kind of knew this, <laughs> But I think in this situation, you've got just so many things running through your mind that you're just trying to make sure you make good decisions. Um, but anyway, the when the engine loses oil pressure uh, for an aerobatic prop uh, or constant speed prop, uh, the propeller goes into a cruise course position. So it ends up reducing drag by somewhere between 70 and 80 percent, I believe. Uh, and that actually made a huge difference in terms of how the plane handled. Now I put the mixture back in here because I, I was like, I wasn't really shooting an approach. I was more or less trying to get a feel for the airplane. Um, so, uh, and also lose some altitude too. Um, so anyway, about the propeller, when you um, lose oil pressure, it goes into cruise course, reduces drag by a lot. And uh, it made a big difference in terms of how the plane handles uh, in the approach, mainly uh, because there's a lot of drag that's, that's disappeared and, and I'm used to flying with a lot of drag from the propeller. Uh, and with the Stalker, it has a very thin profile fuselage, or fuselage profile, I should say, that um, is not draggy at all. So when you're in a slip, it doesn't necessarily want to decelerate. It actually, the speed ends up increasing, uh, which was something I just wasn't expecting. So now the mixture's out. I, I pulled the mixture out before I uh, over uh, crossed the runway. And what's interesting at this point, I'm thinking... It looks like I would make it under normal circumstances if the propeller was in a more fine position, creating a lot of that drag, um, it would have been fine because this is how I normally find my approach. Uh, but it turned out not to be the case and I could tell by how I was flying the approach that I'm making a lot more adjustments than I normally would need because at this point I'm flying a slant base and then I'm like, oh, I'll just keep the runway closed because I don't want to be short and I'm in a slip and the plane's just not slowing down. Now the GoPro doesn't do it justice perspective's way off. I'm high and I'm fast. Putting this plane down would be a huge mistake, so I put the mixture in, initiate a go around, and make an early left-hand turn to stay within that green zone that I talked about. So I keep my circuit somewhat tight, and uh, not as tight as I normally would fly it, but, uh, I figured, well, the plane seems a lot slipperier. Slippery, I guess is the proper word. So let's um, let's just you know widen out a little bit and, and see if I can bleed some speed off. And again, the tendency here is to stay somewhat close because uh, again, I don't want to be in a position where I was low and slow. And uh, you know, at this point, it, it, to me, it felt like I was landing a new airplane because I just had never experienced this before. So I'm in a good slip. I actually put on some G here to bleed off some speed, but it's just not, it's not working. It looks like 
I'll make it. I mean, I'd definitely get the plane down, but with the speed it was at and just how there really wasn't much drag, I would have sure gone off the end of the runway. I'm 100% I'm certain of it. Again, it initiated early left-hand turn. And this time, I go, you know what? I'm just gonna fly it really tight. So I actually join a much tighter downward leg and I pull the mixture out a little bit earlier too. So my plan here is to be at 700 feet AGL. I beam the numbers. And this works out perfect. So my altitude in which I initiated the, uh, the turn was, was bang on. I'm flying again a slant base leg and I actually put on a bit more G here around the corner just to bleed some of that speed and I'm in a full slip. Now the Stoutica doesn't really have an effective rudder. This is about as aggressive a slip as it gets, but the speed is actually decaying, decaying which is exactly what I wanted and I end up wheel landing the airplane on. Nice and gentle, tails up. Now slowly bring the tail down. Tails, tails down, stick back, light braking, and the propeller comes to a stop. So if you take note of where I stop, about 100 feet, maybe less, is the end of the runway. So if you think about the first two approaches, you'll, um, I would have gone off the end for sure, which could have been a very interesting day. Okay, so what did I learn and what were some of the takeaways? The big one for me was not recognizing early enough that the prop goes into coarse pitch when there's a loss of oil pressure. And that loss of oil pressure coming from the fact that I had to shut the engine down by pulling the mixture. What's funny is I knew the prop goes into coarse pitch, but during the situation, I wasn't thinking about it. I was more concerned about flying the airplane and keeping things as normal and standard as possible. So if you take note of my first attempt at a, uh, approach, under normal circumstances with the engine running and the prop and fine pitch, I would have made it because that's how I typically fly all my approaches. Now, when the prop coarsened, it changed the the behavior of the airplane considerably and it reduced drag by by, by large margin. And, and that meant I had to modify my circuit. I either had to fly a wider base leg, extend it downwind, or fly a lower altitude and keep it tight. Um, and in the end, that's what I ended up doing. I ended up opting for the lower altitude, so 700 feet AGL, I beamed the numbers and making that tight turn right to the numbers and that worked out beautifully. Now, for those that don't fly aerobatic airplanes, let me just give you a bit of a, uh, a refresher or, or an understanding of where they differ from conventional constant speed propellers on, on regular airplanes like your Cessnas, et cetera. The, um, in aerobatics, we're operating across a wide range of speed, uh, doing a bunch of different maneuvers. Um, so it's really important to um, to make sure that the propeller is protected from, uh, you know, propeller or engine overspeed. Um, hence why the propeller coarsens when there's a loss of oil pressure. So during zero-g maneuvers, it's fairly common to have a momentary loss in oil pressure. And with the counterweight pr uh, prop, the RPM decreases as the blades move into a higher pitch, They're, therefore uh, preventing... Um, like I said, um, overspeed and uh, potential damage to the uh, to the engine. And now, obviously, in an engine failure type situation where there's a loss of oil pressure, um, this is exactly what it's supposed to do. It goes into course position, uh, which gives you a, a much lower result and drag factor. Takeaway number two, leverage as many options as possible. Some of you might be wondering, did I have to take the 2,000 foot strip at my home base? Could I have diverted to another airport in the area? Uh, to answer that question, yes, I could have. There's quite a few little strips around the area um, and there's a, an airport uh, about uh, 10 minutes to the southwest of my location that has a 4,000 foot runway and a 7,000 foot runway. So I did consider it. Um, however, the risk was I would have to burn gas to get to those airports. And since I was already over the airport, um, I felt that having that 10 minutes of gas available to me here was much better served than trying to fly to another airport and, and, and make it work there. Because I think we've all heard stories of fuel starvation and that kind of thing. I just had, you know, glimpses of, of that type of thing happening where I get really tight on gas and, and now I'm in a real pickle. So um, it was better for me to, to use that 10 minutes of gas to practice approaches and initiate go-arounds if I had to. 
Um, and it worked out in the end because that's exactly what happened. And granted, if I had a longer runway, I probably wouldn't have gone around on the first try. Uh, however, I still feel like it was the right decision in the end. So when time allows, consider everything. Um, you probably have more options than you think. Um, obviously, in certain situations, such as a you know catastrophic engine failure, you mean you don't have much time to think, especially if you're on departure. Um, however, you know you've got options. So um, try and take the time to make a sound decision as quickly as you can. Kind of, which leads me to my next point uh, on takeaway three. Make binary decisions with the time allowed. Now, keep in mind. Um, sometimes situations are very gray and it requ requires your best judgment and sometimes it's not as simple as saying yes or no. Um, however, in this situation, it was very binary. Okay, the throttle cable had disconnected, the engine was completely unresponsive. All right, so I'm going to have to dead stick this airplane to land, so that means I'm going to have to pull the mixture, right? So you kind of go through the sequence of events in your mind about what you have to do. Then the next thing you have to consider is like, okay, where do I land? And, and that's where it can get a little gray sometimes, depending on the situation. I think in my situation, though, it was very black or white. It's either I divert or I don't. And I just made the conscious decision that I'm not going to. And I was committed to that decision and I was not going to deviate from it. Takeaway number four. Consider everything you can within a time limit. I gave myself three to five minutes to secure a plan. In fact, I checked the clock. And in my mind, I'm like, okay, by this time, I'm going to have a decision figured out. And that's exactly what happened. I think it's, I had a decision within about four minutes or so. Um, so once I made that decision and came up with the plan, I stuck with it. I didn't deviate. However, I did make contingencies for um, potential risk factors, such as if I fly in approach and my short final, I don't like the profile, I initiate a go around, I put the mixture back in, the engine doesn't come back online. Um, then I'm going to commit and just land the airplane. If I put the mixture back in and immediately climb out and the engine gets rough and for whatever, for whatever reason fails, um, I'm going to get the plane down. I'm just going to do the best I can. I'm not going to hesitate. So uh, that time limit really gave me a, a lot more flexibility in terms of my decision making because then it, it basically created a binary exercise in my head in terms of this is going to happen these are the outcomes. What are the decisions that I'm going to have to make? Takeaway number five, uh, staying calm. Now, this is easier said than done. And at the end of the day, we're human beings. Um, so we're, we're prone to emotions and, and human responses to situations. Now, for me, what I found that's worked really well in my life is just accepting what has happened. And as soon as I can accept what has happened, and not put myself in a, a phase of denial or um, a situation where uh, it's creating delays or hesitancy. Uh, it allows me to get really focused on the task at hand. And uh, it's worked for me every time. Um, now, I'm fortunate as well. I, this is not the first time I've had a situation in an airplane. I've had abnormal situations. I've had uh, emergencies, that kind of thing. Um, so I have the, you know, I guess, luxury to draw from that experience to help me think through this. Um, however, I still remember the first time I had a perceived emergency. I just soloed. Um, I was 14, 15. And um, on the climb out, shortly after takeoff, uh, the oil pressure gauge just went right to zero. Now, my immediate response was, shit, this is happening. And uh, fortunately enough, uh, it was on a long runway at an international airport in a Cessna 152. So I just pushed the nose down and, and landed. And I still remember how I felt. It was very, um, you know, scary. Let's be honest, it's scary. And um, over the years, as you kind of experience certain things, you just, you know, it's, it's, it's another notch on the belt and you kind of learn from it. And um, so, look, this is easier said than done, but I think it really helps when you convince yourself that you've got a problem and you're going to have to deal with it. And that just forces you to uh, get focused. Takeaway number six. There's really uh, two points here. The first one is practice out engine out procedures as much as you can. So um, granted, this is very individual dependent. If you're really experienced and you, you know what you're doing and you've got good judgment, obviously go nuts. Um, exercise common sense, that kind of thing. That's my disclaimer. And for anyone who's um, relatively new, I mean, go with an instructor. You, you need to be taught this stuff. It's so critical. 
you know, I practice this a lot. Um, not in the Stoica necessarily. I, I mostly do it in the uh, Acro Sport Two, where um, where I'll you know pull the power in different segments of the circuit, such as you know on the crosswind leg um, during departure, or you know early downwind, or shit even overhead the field or directly over the threshold, um, where I have to try and get the airplane in uh, on the runway in a set amount of distance. Um, I've even gone as far as pulling the, the power to idle during an aerobatic maneuver and simulating an engine failure. And I think that's extremely important in terms of creeping up your proficiency because when it really hits you, you want the flying to be as natural as possible, which goes to my next point. Um, you got to fly the wing, right? We all know the mantra, aviate, navigate, communicate. Super important. But the most important part, which you all know, is aviate. So learn to fly the airplane, fly the wing, understand how that wing works, understand what your airplane likes, what it doesn't like, and and get really proficient at it because it will it will save your ass if you're if you're in a really bad situation. So don't um you know don't hesitate to get out there and, and expand your horizons a little bit. Um obviously be smart about it and safe. Um but guys, this is the these are the takeaways. This is what I've learned and, and things I've learned over the years, and I really hope you got value out of this and found this uh, video informative engaging and if you've got any questions feel free to reach out to me directly or even if you've got any feedback i'd love to hear it um, again i'm putting this video out here to help promote safety and since i was able to capture this whole thing unfold on camera i felt it was my duty to share it and and uh you know we can all learn from it and get better so uh fly safe and fly well and uh, i'll talk to you soon thanks